pleasure of introducing Dr. Peter Sommer. He's with Gusmer Enterprises, and he's a uh, director of all of our biological research for yeast and bacteria. And he can continue with his background. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I, uh, I'm a microbiology by heart and trade, and I've been doing microbiology for almost 30 years in various subjects. And uh, one of the most favorite ones are by far the wine industry. And uh, I've been uh, working with uh, for Christiansen for many, many years and was part of the uh, wine group and uh, was taking part of selecting the different yeast and non sex uh, you know, some years ago. Very interesting journey. So today um, I'm going to shift direction a little bit. Um, now we've heard a lot about yeast. Now we're going to talk about bacteria. For some, shocking news. For others, you know, things that you knew, you knew already. Some very hands-on uh, things you can consider when you decide on uh, how do you inoculate the, the bacteria, which product to choose, and in which dose. So it's me in the back with the brown bag. I'm the nerd. I wear the glasses. Um, sorry to, to disturb you in your hard work. Um, but uh, I think uh, you will learn that I, I think I have some very, really important information about this very unique fermentation of malactic fermentation. So you should be aware that there is something called the magic number. Uh, for some reason, the caucus needs to be in a certain population size before it starts degrading the malic acid to lactic acid. It's not a trick to sell more products, but it is uh, a, a fact that you need to be aware of. And then just, if you look at the numbers of bacteria or yeast you put into your, your process, it's enormous. It's a, around 25 trillion cells that needs to go into just a small bit of wine of 6,660 gallons. It's actually more than 3,000 more cells than there are human beings on this earth. But when you are looking at the various commercial products on the market, I am sorry to say, but they, it's not the same. You can't compare all of them. You have to be aware of, of certain things that you can actually investigate yourself. And I'll walk you through that. Uh, they are definitely different in the numbers of cells you get, but also how they are adapted to the wine because it's a very, very tough environment for living microorganisms. If you do add too little amounts of these bacteria, you will, your malactic fermentation won't, won't start. And there's also a bigger risk that it is definitely not the bacteria you put in that finish your malactic fermentation, if at all. And then, although it's very, very specific niche for this bacteria in the caucus to live in wine, there are different characteristics in each of the strains that are out on the market. Some are for lower temperature, some for high alcohols, some can sustain more uh, SO2. So it's very important to choose the right microorganism. So this presentation will take you through to which genus is in a caucus, what does, when, how, how does it evolve, what is it capable of doing in wine? It can degrade sugars, it can convert malic, and convert citric acid. And then I'll go through the, the strain characteristics, how you should prepare, or the different ways of preparing uh, in a caucus for the, for the inoculation into wine, and then really stressing this magic number, the amount of bacteria you need to have in your process. Nucoccus is a very specialized bacteria. It has found a niche where very few other microorganisms can survive. And it, it can sustain low pH, and high alcohol, and at, especially at the lower pH range, it's almost the only one who can survive there. It's placed along the lactobacilli strains of a species. Oops, wrong one. Here. And you can see that it's also close to the pediococcus, but it has its own unique branch in this phylogeny uh, tree. It's a gram-positive bacteria. So those of you who's tried lysozyme, it works on gram-positives. It also work on inococcus. It's a heterofermentative strain, which means that it's not, it can convert 
different sugars, the two different uh, metabolites, like acetic acid, lactic acid, and CO2. You can see a very, very nice picture out here. It's an electron microscope of this bacteria. It grows normally in pairs of two when they're, when they're doing fine. But some have, might know C835. It's, it's a very unique strain. Uh, it goes in cell five. And then be really a, be careful about this, these pH and temperature ranges because it's very important for making sure that when you have added a bacteria that you actually, uh, that they're able to grow under these conditions. So the pH is, it ranges from 2.9 up to 5. So the lower the pH, the more it's only in a caucus that are growing in your wine. Approaching the higher pH, then you see lactobacillus coming in, pediococcus, and they can also degrade malic acid. And then the temperature is important to be aware of. Um, Nothing happens for, you know, if, when you lower your temperature in, in your process, you slow down the metabolism of this organism. It goes for every organism. But it's, it will not kill the cell. It will be dormant. And we know from like, cold cellars that if you haven't completed your malactive fermentation before winter time, it will slow down and stop, but it will come back in spring. And it's related to the temperature. However, at the higher temperature ranges, that's where you have to be, pay attention, because that's when you are crossing a boundary where you start to, to impair the quality of the, the, the life of this organism. So, and for those of you who are trying co-inoculations, you might easily get above 77 Fahrenheit. Or if you're adding the bacteria at the time just when uh, your alcoholic fermentation is completed, you will have higher temperature than 77. And that is not very good for this uh, type of organism. And then, of course, be aware that adding SO2 is an antimicrobial uh, compound, and it would definitely also impair uh, the life of Inococcus. So when you start to get SO2 levels about 30 to 45, then you start to see inhibition and a killing. But it's very pH dependent. Lower pH, you have a more antimicrobial effect of SO2. All right, so now this is the stage. This is the organism. This is what's doing the magic stuff in your wines when you want to get the malolactic fermentation going. So going into the, the metabolism of this organism, again, it's very unique in the sense that it's found its niche in wine. So a lot of these strains can degrade sugars. Um, both fructose and glucose, but also, also other uh, carbohydrates. And it will convert it into various byproducts, acetic acid, lactic acid, so on. Uh, I'll come back a little bit later that it seems to be pH dependent which metaboli metabolism it, it prefers. But the main reason why you're looking into enococcus is that you want your malolactic fermentation to, con to com be completed. So it takes in malic acid through the membrane and through a series of enzymatic conversions, decarboxylate malic acid into lactic acid and CO2. And in that process, it's able to generate some energy in terms of ATP. You say, this, su this substrate is very poor. It's getting very little energy out of degrading the malic acid compared to sugars. But it is a niche. It's a way of surviving, and it can actually grow on it, but slow. Then this very interesting conversion of citric acid is also a way of surviving. It's not to make butter in your wine. It's a, it's a process that it, it can do. So it can take in citric acid through the membrane and do a series of conversions into a central metabolite called pyruvate. And then from there, it can go to different branches. So be aware, in this process, you do, do get some acetic acid. Uh, from that. It also produces D-lactic. But whether you like it or not, it has the capability to convert citric acid into diacetyl. But this is a, you say, an intermediate process because it's actually not an enzymatic conversion. It's an aerobic chemical decarbo 
decarboxylation, which means that the alpha acetolactate is in the presence of oxygen, will be converted to diacetyl. And then an enzymatic reaction starts in order to regenerate some NADP, and it will convert it back to acetylene and 2.3 butane diol. So that's important to know. If you have wines where you don't want the diacetyl, wait, be patient. The microbiology will take care of it. The organism will reabsorb the diacetyl, and it will permanently degrade it into compounds that are not you know, the buttery note. But you can say it's more on the butterscotch uh, part here. If you do want a lot of this diacetyl, this, this, uh, in this publication illustrate really nicely what, what you can actually do with it. They, they made some wine and made some anaerobic conditions where there was very little oxygen present, and then what they call semi-anaerobic conditions with a little bit more oxygen. And then they, they were following the different compounds made by uh, this inococcus. One of the interesting things here is that under anaerobic conditions, they produce very little diacetyl. And that's because it's in, the oxygen is needed for that process. So it only had two milligrams of uh, diacetyl in this case. But if you add a little bit of oxygen into a process, you have a dramatic increase in the amount of diacetyl. It's an, almost a seven-fold increase of diacetyl. So if you want have, to have a style of wine where you want the diacetyl, you have to be very careful because you only have a very short time span to capture as much of the diacetyl as possible before it's converted again into acetylene. But if you don't want it, that's the process where you wait. Don't sulfur your wine at that stage. And I'll also explain why you shouldn't do that at this stage if you don't want it. Because the, the yeast are capable of assimilating the diacetyl, as well as the enococcus. So it will disappear permanently for you. But if you want it, that's where you start to, to pay attention. And then, of course, there was some smart uh, winemakers that said, I could, I could add some citric acid. I mean, I, I want more of this stuff. And yes, you can certainly do that. And in the same experiments, they added one gram of citric acid, did the same experiments with under anaerobic conditions and semi-anaerobic conditions. And you can see here that actually on the anaerobic part, it, I mean, it didn't get that much more diacetyl. And that's again related to the amount of oxygen present. But the dramatic effect is definitely on the semi-anaerobic conditions where you had like 30 milligrams of diacetyl. And you can start detecting diacetyl around one to two milligrams depending on if it's wet, whites or reds. So this is an option you can play around with if you want kind of a, a tank that you can blend from. But uh, you will see in a moment that uh, there's a price to pay if you're adding citric acid. You will produce a lot of acetic acid as well. So I just looked at uh, stoch the stoichiometry of, of conversion of, of citric acid. And you can do the, the math of the molecular formula of a citric and acetic acid, and then do a, a, a conversion. And basically, if you add one gram of citric acid, more than half of it will be converted into acetic acid. And then at this level, it's higher than the legal limits. But again, as a blending tool, that's a possibility that you can actually control more the, the diacetyl that we want in your, in your whites. So be aware of that. So it's a disclaimer. If you are playing around with adding citric acid, um, you might run into problems with the acetic acid. And then SO2 is a, a, it's an oxygen scavenger, or a, it's an antimicrobial uh, compound, but it also has the capability of binding to, to diacetyl, which is illustrated in this. So the diacetyl end here it combines with the, with the sulfur molecules and will make a sulfur complex that from a flavor point of view or a sensory point of view, will mask the diacetyl. So if you are a winemaker that looks for getting a lot of diacetyl and you add the SO2, 
then suddenly the flavor disappears, and it's like, what's going on? And it's actually because it's combining uh, with SO2. But it's a reversible, it's a reversible reaction, so it will slowly release the diastole back to the wine. So bear that in mind. If you want more of it, be sure that you uh, have a window of one to three weeks where you can start smelling it before it disappears again. If you need to capture it, you can rack off the lees, you can lower the temperature a little bit, because the yeast, although it's not very metabolic active or growing, it still, it still has some metabolic activity, and it will absorb the diastole and it will disappear. Um, so the SO2 is, is shading the diastole, so be aware of that. And that also goes, with, if you don't want the diastole, if you're adding the SO2 at, at an early stage, you think that the problem goes away, but suddenly when you do the tasting six months later for the blending, it will disappear, uh, re reappear, and uh, you probably wonder why. So be careful about it. So in summary, this, uh, my, this unique microorganism is able to convert sugars into different products, but it seems to be related to the pH. And again, I think it's something with the ecological niche. At this, at this uh, point that there, I don't know what activates the, the genes and the, 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 the biochemistry in the cell, but it's, then you can start preferring to, to, to convert the sugars. And that is, could potentially become a problem if you have a sluggish or stock alcoholic fermentation, you still have a lot of sugar there, and you have an active population of inococcus, then they will convert it into acetic acid. And that's, you can say, when you do co-inoculation, that's where you have to be sure that you, ha you have everything under control so you don't end up having an, a stock ferment. But a, a pH around or lower than 3.5 seems to prefer the malic over the sugar. You can always check if you do have enzymatic tools to, to measure your malic. It's always, you know, the, the, the isomer of malic, it can go into D and L forms. And the L form is always, so the L malic is always converted to L lactic. And if it comes from sugar, it will always be D lactic. Or from citric acid, it's also D lactic. So it's a way of tracing where, where your where lactic is coming from. You can, you can have, you can manage your, your, your malolactic fermentation so you can steer it towards more diacetyl or less diacetyl or no diacetyl. And then be sure to have some, a little bit of oxygen in your process if you want the diacetyl um, because it's a, a process that requires some oxygen. And then there seems to be a general rule that malic acid is preferred over citric acid. So you can see the malic acid disappear. So when it's becoming depleted, that's, that's where you see a pickup of the citric acid uh, conversion. All right, so that was a little bit of the stage. Now we have talked a little bit about the genus and the species, a little bit about the metabolism. Now I'm going to go into, uh, you can say, the characteristics of the different strains that are out on the market. Um, and they are isolated from different wineries around the world. And you can have you know, wines. Uh, I've worked with a French uh, champagne house in Nepane. They had a house strain they, they were very fond of, but they also liked to have it as a, as a pure strain. But when we picked it out of the, the base wine, it was so damaged. It, it was missing more than thousands of its gene out of a, a total amount of genes of 2,500. So it's really so adapted to that condition of very low pH and malic acid that it was not able to do much more than that. And that goes with different strains. You have strains that are good for high alcohol. Some are better at lower temperature and so on. So be, be careful when you select your strain uh, to the, so it, it, it works under the right condition. And then be aware, I have to stress it out, and I will show you later, there are different amount of cells in the products out on the market. And again, when we ha have the fact that the magic number of one million cells per mil, that has an impact on your process. The, the adaptation of the, of the different products on the market is also very different. 
it's a very, very complicated process of manufacturing these bacteria. They need to go from a dormant stage directly into wine, where you have high alcohol, you have low pH, and other, you say, antagonistics that works against any life in that, under those conditions. So they have to be really well adapted to the conditions. Otherwise, they will either completely die or there will be a subpopulation that will eventually come up and grow, but it will extend the time for your malolactic fermentation. And then you can see that some products standardize their, their products with a carrier, like maltodextrin. And you can often see the differences, for some Christiansen's products is, is pellets, uh, whether it's frozen, like more wet pellets, and then you have the freeze-dried, which is these popcorn structures. They don't add that carrier, but you have others that are grinded and you have like a fine powder, and that's often where you see this added maltodextrin. There are different ways of managing the adaptation for, for wine conditions. And you can say in, in, in the past, uh, that was the only option. You build up your own house strain, and you hope that you reached the right amount of cells, and then you can start inoculating your, your, your process with this. It gives some problems. It takes time. It's a very slow-growing strain. There's risk that other bacteria and yeast can contaminate that, that uh, mother strain, you know, the mother's tank. So it's a risky business. Uh, and then when you look at some of the commercial products that are are on the market. There are some that are recommended for what they call pre-activation. So you have to wait like 24, sometime up to 48 hours before they adapt to the conditions. And I think it's all about that the cell membrane has to be well, well in, you know, it has to be integral. So the pH of the cell is much higher than the outside environment. So it needs to keep that pH difference and that costs energy. And if it's punctured, that membrane, it's a very serious situation for the bacteria. And if, you're not, if it's not able to repair that membrane, it will die. So I think that's the reason why it's recommended that you wait so you pre-activate it uh, for a couple of days. Then there are also products on the market say you can do a quick reactivation for like 15 minutes in non-chlorinated uh, water. And I don't know, I mean, not, not much happens there, but at least it gets hydrated. So, but I don't know the mechanism, what's actually going on with such a short time span. And then you have what I think is a great innovation to the industry, a product that you can actually add directly and it will survive and it will do its job. This is tough to make, and that's why I think we see different variation of this, but it has an impact on your process. So again, I can't stress enough, you need one million cells or more before you see any activity going on uh, with the de de degradation of malic acid. You have to find cultures that are adapted for the wine conditions. Otherwise, you're wasting your money and your time. So I can only encourage you, ask for the documentation on how is this product adapted for wine. Can you show me any data that shows that you do you do any QC testing, or is there anything that kind of can reassure me that I'm buying this product uh, up against another product, so why, why should I choose yours? It's only fair to ask. And I want to illustrate what, it, what a difference it makes in your process when the cells are not there up, you know, at the one million mark. This is an example of a trial I did in, in Australia, in the Shiraz. And they, they, there was a huge operation, like uh, for bulk wine, and they were just interested in, in getting a higher throughput of their tanks. They had thousands of fermenting, fermenter tanks, and uh, it was quite a night, nightmare for the crew to make sure that they could turn these tanks around in the time that they needed. Um, and they were, they were used to this kind of stretching or cross seating, where they kind of had a tank with a full dose, and then from that they were stretching it out to, to other tanks. So I did a trial with some frozen bacteria, uh, where I did a direct inoculation 
that product was again then stretched. And then they had, unintentionally, quite a few of the tanks were going through spontaneous. It was uh, a real problem for them. Um, so, but it was not an intentional thing. And here you can see the time span that is, that is uh, between these three you know, collation methods. It took 22 days to complete with the frozen bacteria direct inoculated. It took an additional two weeks to complete the, the cross seeded or the stretch culture, and again, additional two weeks for the spontaneous to go. So that prolongation of your process is all related to the amount of cells and adapted cells. So are they able to grow under these wine conditions? determines the time of your malactic fermentation. So now we've looked at the malic conversion, which is the most often used method for tracking how your malactic fermentation is going on. But I can only encourage you to kind of start spreading the cells on plates because it has an enormous value for you. So this is the direct inoculation. And here it's illustrated. It's a perfect adapted strain. There's no dip in cells that go below the one million mark or the magic number. It stays up there, it starts to grow, and you see the malic acid converted, 22 days. The same product, again, some very adapted cell, but now they're stretched to a point where there's 15 times less amount of cells. So we're down from up here, uh, above the one million mark, down to 100,000 cells per mil. There's no dip because they are very well adapted. They will start to grow, and, and this just perfectly illustrates this cross. When they hit this mark, they start to degrade the malic acid. But at that time for those cells to, to grow up to the one million cells per mil is determining the, the length of your process. And again, the spontaneous. In this particular case, it's actually very low. I've seen a lot of different wines where you had a sp spontaneous flora that was almost a million cells. And that's why you probably sometimes see that your malactive fermentation goes fast, even an additional flora, because you have a house strain of a mix of all kinds of enococcus, maybe uh, also mixed in with some lactobacilli that can do the job. So it's important to know, it, you know the time it takes to complete is related to the amount of cells and the adaptation of those cells. So how can you, how can you know? I mean, you, a lot of vendors are coming and, and presenting the different bacteria, and I'm sure they promise you know, everything that it will just be fine. Just buy my product, and uh, your malactive fermentation will, will go fine. So I just looked at what's publicly available on the, on the web page on what are the specifications on a product, what are the recommended dose, and then you can do a very simple calculation of how many cells do I get. Do I get above, equal, or below the one million mark? And I think it's very important in your decision which products you go for. I have to say, in this calculation, I'm not taking into account how well adapted the cells are. That's a different thing, because you can have a product made with all the cells you need, but if they're not adapted to the conditions, they will die and you will be below the one million again. This producer claims on the pouch or the product that we claim that for in this pouch, you will be guaranteed more than seven times 10 to the 12 CFU per pouch. Good. Well, how do we relate that to my wine condition? Then you should start looking for what are the recommended dose for this amount of bacteria. And in this case, they say this is, this is what we recommend for 660 gallons. Good. Variable information. You can convert gallons to liter and then milliliter, because that's in microbiology, it's CFU per milliliter or per gram. So basically, you take that number up here, put it on, on, on this uh, equation, so 7 times 10 to the 12 CFU in the recommended wine uh, dose. And then you end up with a number of 2.8 times to the 6 CFU. So almost three times more than the matching number. So this is 
I would say, just looking at this, you're getting a lot of cells. Another producer claims on their pouch, the viable amount of bacteria in this pouch is 10 to the 11 CFU, and now it's per gram, it's not per pouch. But it doesn't matter, we can still calculate it. Because when they, they look at the dosage recommendation, they say 25 grams of this product goes into 660 gallons. So then we do the math again. We take the 25 grams, multiply it with 10 to 11th, and divide it by 2.5 million milliliter. This product contains 1 million cells per mil in your final wine. Three times as less than the other one. I think it's important for you guys to know that you can very easily do that calculation. And that should, I would re highly recommend you to take that into consideration when you, you're buying your product. Especially when you look at the price. I'm not talking about the price here. Um, so you can also look at the different products on the market in, in another way. So here we illustrated, I have Christy Hansen's product. Just looking at what's available out there. See, this is public knowledge. This is the amount of cells that goes into wine. I did the math of all of them. This one is a little bit below, and it's actually CA35, but it has, as I said, it's growing in chains of five instead of two, so it's actually, it has the amount of cells you need. And then there's different competitive products that varies in numbers. And just bear in mind, the red line here indicates where you want to be. You want to be above that line to get your malolactic fermentation going. Then you say, does it really matter, this? Um, I, maybe it's cheaper, I don't know. Maybe you like it for other reasons. But just bear in mind, if you turn it around and look at a percentage, saying one of Christian Hans's uh, products, if I convert that to the amount of cells in that product, convert that to 100%. How, is, how much of percentage of bacteria do I then get from the others? Then I, I, I start to think, you know, that's a huge difference. And I think that's important to know. And then you can also look at, okay, if it was a yeast or even lactobacilli, they grow and double in hours. A yeast cell can double within four, six, eight hours, depending on the conditions. Same with lactobacilli, it grows also very fast. Unfortunately, Inococcus grows really slow. And here's an illustration from the literature. They did a trial with, uh, in, a, in, a, in a synthetic wine, in lab condition though, and they added some different sugars. It's not relevant for my point here. I just took that control where they didn't add any sugar. Then they measured the, what's called the maximum specific growth rate, Emax. And that you can do, you can do a calculation and then actually determine how many hours or days is that corresponding to. The, in, this ex, in this experiment, the Inococcus was doubling every 3.6 days, almost four days to, to double. And I've been working uh, at a lot of wineries where I did also the calculation. I've seen numbers down to this, up to seven, eight, ten days for doubling, depending on how harsh the wine is. So yes, it does matter. And that also explains why when you do full inoculation, you do stretching, or you do spontaneous, there's a difference in the time of your process. And it's related to that fact. So again, going back to the, uh, the slide, then I converted the, the Vini Florina, saying this is the amount of cells that are here. So how long would it take for the other products to come to the same amount of cells. Because you can, that's some relevant thing. I mean, is it a, a matter of a couple of days, or should I wait a couple of weeks, or whatever? In this case, you can see that the magic number, it takes one and a half generations to get up to the same number, just to get to the magic number. And then we know that it grows, let's, in this example, it's 3.6 days, so it takes approximately 14 days to get up to the same amount. And then it just gets worse and worse, 24 days, 29. And in all fairness, this is a strain that is not a direct inoculation strain. It's for, for, for propagation. This illustrates that the amount of cells is extremely important for you to choose, and also the way it's adapted. So again, pointing to the fact that this 
delay is related to the amount of cells. So if I were you guys, I, would, I, I just wanted you to have the toolbox to ask the vendor, saying, how many cells do I get per gram or per pouch? What is that? What is your recommended dose range? How many cells can I expect to be in the wine when I inoculate? And what is the price per cell? Well, it's, it's a lot of cells, so it's a very low value, but you can do the calculation anyway. How adapted are the product you're selling? And how do you test that? I think it's important because you can, you can uh, select the strain, you can add it in, and because you rarely do any plating, you, you may be following the malolactic conversion by looking at the malic numbers, but you don't know if you're very low in numbers or you're just about to hit the one million mark or you're up above it, and you don't know which organisms are in there. So it's also, I think, in relation to the presentation you're gonna, you've already heard and what you're gonna hear uh, after me is, is about this bioprotection bio concept uh, that I think Christian Hansen is doing a marvelous job to, to, uh, to communicate out to the industry that it's all about dominating with the right amount of bacteria, the right bacteria, the right yeast, in order for, for the unwanted microorganism to be suppressed. And um, I think, so it's not only the time it takes to finish a malic fermentation, there's also that gap of opportunities for other unwanted organisms to take the space. Because it's all about the space and the nutrients and, and, um, and the, the, the timing of, of, uh, of the, the presence in the wine. So if you want to protect your wine, get the right amount of cells in there with the right product. And you will start to suppress lactobacilli, pediococcus, uh, that I know uh, you, you must have you know, hit that, uh, that problem sometimes in your career, that by having the right amount of bacteria in there and yeast, you can really suppress those unwanted organisms. So be aware, more than one million cells is important. Not all commercial products have the same quality when it comes to numbers and adaptation. When you add your bacteria, if you add too low, you, you just initiate the risk that something else will take over and be sure to ask to, to choose the right bacteria for, for your process because there is a, there's a difference. All right, so I banged the pouch, so I'm hoping uh, you have some good questions or at least you had some food for thought about this fact. Yes? So I've got a question as far as adding nutrient along with the bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, does the growth rate increase, uh, or does it, does it go faster when you add the nutrient along with it? Um, or would the number stay pretty similar to 3.6 days? Yeah, it, 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 it won't help. The maximum growth rate is, is um, it's determined by the biochemistry of the cell, but also the, the environment. So if it, if it has the perfect conditions, that's the, that's the maximum growth rate. You can't push it beyond that. But definitely the nutrients will help them be able to, to perform what they are supposed to do because they need some, they need some essential nutrients to, to, to grow in the wine. So for example, manganese is a key cofactor for, for the malolactic enzyme to work. So, uh, but also other like vitamins and trace minerals are important. So unfortunately, no, but it will make sure that they have the ability to grow. Any other questions? Was it a surprise uh, to hear this, or you know that you know I, I when I do this, I know I have this delay or. If I add direct inoculation, it, it goes more consistent or... I hope you, uh, you had some, some ideas of, you know, maybe if you want to change your practice, that there are some benefits of doing that. But every choice has a consequence. So 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you.